The morning light reveals the full extent of the crash. The La Mia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain called Cerro Gordo. The plane was configured for landing. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. But it crashed 10 miles short of the runway. Cathay Pacific Flight 780 is cruising at 38,000 feet over the South China Sea. Captain Malcolm Waters and his crew are nearing the end of a four and a half hour flight from Indonesia to Hong Kong. 165 miles from Hong Kong airport, the Airbus leaves cruising altitude and begins its descent. And then something goes wrong. The flight computer is alerting the pilots to a problem. Okay, let's see what we got. Engine two stall. The plane's monitoring system indicates there's an issue with the right engine, engine number two. With no explanation for the incident, Captain Waters reduces power on the engine to idle to protect it from damage. Idle. The lowest possible power level while still keeping it running. The pilots prepare to land the Airbus with only one engine. Everything is set for an emergency landing. But then, another alert and more vibrations. Engine one stall. Engine one stall confirmed. Things have gone from bad to worse. The monitoring system indicates they've just lost the other engine, the one they were counting on to get the plane to Hong Kong. The monitoring system tells the pilots to put the malfunctioning engine number one into idle. They are a minute from touchdown. Then, another alert. It's overspeed. It's an overspeed warning, a signal the aircraft is flying too fast. Captain Waters can't figure it out. They should be slowing down. He rechecks the controls. Then, he sees it. Engine number one, which he throttled back minutes earlier, is still running at 74% power. High thrust, too high to land safely. Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Their speed is over 100 miles per hour faster than normal. So fast, the flight computer doesn't recognize that the pilots are trying to land. Captain Waters pushes the nose down, forcing the Airbus onto the runway. is getting close to the end of the runway. Finally, the aircraft comes to a halt just a short distance from the water's edge. They've used up more than 8,800 feet, over a mile and a half of runway. Once the aircraft did stop, there's a look of what the hell just happened. In Hong Kong, a team of investigators begins trying to unravel the mystery of Cathay Pacific Flight 780's two malfunctioning engines. They retrieve the black box flight data recorder from the rear of the aircraft. It contains information about the plane's functions throughout the flight. The data on board the aircraft is, is key in this type of investigation. Investigators upload the data from the recorder. We need to see throttle position and fuel flow. The device records 359 data parameters. They focus in on the A330's engine functions. Stop. What's going on here? Right away, they notice something unusual. Thrust levers are moving, but fuel flow's flatlining. 
After the pilots had tried to restore power to the engines by pushing the throttle up, the fuel flow remained the same. So the warnings that were coming up were warnings to do with the main metering valve supplying fuel to the engine. The main metering valve is made up of a piston that slides within a cylinder. When pilots move the thrust levers, it increases or decreases the flow of fuel to the A330's turbofan engines. That valve wasn't moving, uh, wasn't able to respond to the commands. To figure out why the metering valve malfunctioned, the investigators send it to Rolls-Royce for analysis. After cutting open the valve to study it... That's not normal, is it? They find something they've never seen before. A strange white substance coating the walls of the valve. X-ray analysis reveals the chemical makeup of the material. It shows that the powder is a type of superabsorbent polymer, or SAP. When it comes into contact with water, it creates a gel-like substance. The investigators know that the powder is used in refueling trucks to prevent water from getting into aircraft fuel tanks. The refueling trucks pump fuel from underground tanks and pipes through a filter on the truck and into the aircraft. If the fuel is contaminated with water, the powder in the filter absorbs it by forming a gel inside the filter. But the waterlogged gel is supposed to stay in the filter. It should never end up in the fuel. It is so commonly used within the industry for this purpose of filtering out water. What we didn't understand was how did it get on board the aircraft? Reno, Nevada, desert town and the state's original gaming capital. Today, Reno is hosting a very different kind of high stakes game. A gamble in the sky known as the National Championship Air Races. About 100,000 spectators attend this five-day event to watch everything from biplanes to jets zoom around an eight-mile course in the desert. The highlight at Reno is the unlimited class championship race. Unlimited because it includes a range of both modified and stock World War II fighters. The course is marked by 10 pylons, 50-foot tall poles planted in the desert. The finish line is right in front of the grandstand. Hey, how you doing? Good. Who'd hand me that ratchet, way? At 74, race pilot Jimmy Leeward is a legend in Reno. He's raced here for 30 years. Today, Jimmy's flying a highly modified P-51 Mustang fighter. Since Jimmy's plane was built, it's been heavily modified to reduce drag and increase speed. Good luck, Jimmy. See you, Hood. We're gonna break a record today. Wish I could be up there with you. <laughs> if Jimmy can get the galloping ghost to break 500 miles an hour, his prediction will come true. At 4.05, the last qualifying heat for the unlimited class is set to go. The galloping ghost accelerates for takeoff. On the ground, Jimmy's team tracks the galloping ghost on their flight data monitoring system. Speed, engine performance, oil pressure, and more. Everything is working perfectly. As the galloping ghost rounds pylon eight, it suddenly pitches up hard. Jimmy Leeward's galloping ghost is now out of control over the grandstand and dives toward a crowd of helpless spectators. just nine seconds, this race has turned into a nightmare. It's the worst disaster in the history of the Reno Air Races. The worst year that we had had previously was 2007, where three pilots died. 
but never before had we injured a spectator. That's a fuselage. Oh, I don't know, Howard. Trying to ID these pieces seems almost impossible. You're right. It looks like a scrap heap. <laughs> One week after Jimmy Leeward's modified P-51 Mustang crashed at the Reno Air Races, NTSB investigators still don't understand what caused the disaster. So far, the investigators' biggest clue is an eight-inch piece of trim tab that's separated from the aircraft's tail section. But they have no idea how or why it broke off. You know, this plane flew in World War II. It was almost 70 years old, and it was highly modified for speed. Maybe it was too modified. Crookshanks and Plagans wonder if years of modifications to the Galloping Ghost turned a sturdy fighter into an unstable racing machine. They now need to look into how it was altered. We had to learn quite a bit about the P-51, and all the information we had was on the stock airplane. Luke Gibson tells investigators he thinks the Ghost was the most modified P-51 that ever raced in the unlimited class. It had the most radically clipped wings of any P-51 Mustang ever. Gibson helps the NTSB investigators compare the P-51's original blueprints to the rebuilt Galloping Ghost. In the war, the P-51 needed all this wing for long-range missions. But a race is only 50 miles. Jimmy needed speed, not range. They discover that in the 60s, the Galloping Ghost had its wings shortened by eight feet and its tail by one foot changes that made the plane lighter and more streamlined. A less wing. I see he overhauled his engine. Took his top speed from 300 to 500 miles an hour, maybe more. Wow. But there's one big problem. You find anything on the flight tests? Nothing. Zip. There are no records of Leeward ever flight testing the modifications. Investigators can't be sure if the changes he made were safe. It was incredibly frustrating that there was no information. The fact that there was no testing of any of the modifications was alarming to us. In a hangar at Schiphol Airport, researchers with the Netherlands Aviation Safety Board scour the wreckage for clues to explain the crash of Flight 433. They need to know if the plane suffered a flight control malfunction. We want to exclude all possible factors that could have contributed to the accident. Uh, let's start with the rudder. The investigation team knows the plane veered to the right during the landing attempt, but they don't know why. In the air, Pilots move the rudder left and right to control the plane's yaw, or horizontal rotation. It's a critical control service for helping them line up with the runway. The investigators want to see if the rudder malfunctioned just before landing. They need to examine the rudder locking device. It's used to lock the rudder in place to prevent it from moving in a heavy wind while on the ground. Did the rudder lock somehow engage during flight, causing a catastrophic loss of control? Can I take a look? A rudder lock, if it would be still on, would certainly degrade the authority of the rudder. So you check that. They study the rudder components. They look for any sign of a malfunction in the gust lock system. There's nothing wrong with it. The lock is fine. We didn't find anything wrong with the gust lock. Further analysis reveals that all of the plane's other flight control surfaces were also working properly. Flaps 20. Flaps 
20. The cause of the deadly disaster lies somewhere else. KLM 423, can you give me any details? The investigators know that the KLM pilots reported an oil pressure problem. KLM 433, situation's under control. We have an engine oil pressure problem in engine number two. They need to know what that problem was and if it contributed to the crash. Well, turbines are moving. There's no evidence that the engines overheated or seized up due to a lack of oil. Any damages from the impact? Not from oil pressure. There's no evidence of any oil pressure issues at all. It appears the pilots reported a problem that didn't exist. Testing the oil pressure gauges and warning systems from the Saab 340 should tell investigators if the KLM pilots were getting accurate oil pressure readings. There's nothing wrong here. The gauge is working fine. They find no malfunction in the oil pressure gauge. Hold on. That shouldn't happen. But the warning light is another matter. OK, let's, uh, let's do it again. OK. Hmm. That's strange. It's uh, giving an intermittent warning. It's another surprising discovery. The oil pressure warning light sometimes activates even when the pressure is normal. Digging deeper, they examine the switch that controls the warning light. Ah, OK. There's a short circuit in the switch. Now they understand what the pilots were seeing, a false warning. Right engine oil pressure. An electrical short in the oil pressure switch caused the warning light to come on when it shouldn't have. The oil pressure warning itself was false, and the engine was operating normally. So they were seeing a false warning. That doesn't explain the accident. The discovery raises as many questions as it answers. A false warning alone shouldn't lead to a crash. While they wait for the black box data, the investigators interview witnesses to understand what happened to Flight 808. So you saw the whole thing? Yeah, I watched him come in. They learned that the pilots of a U.S. Navy transport watched the plane's final moments. Here it comes. On 10. They were near the runway when Flight 808 began its approach. We were fortunate there was a C-130 crew, so you have some qualified pilots who are actually watching this airplane, the DC-8, as it was trying to, uh, to land on runway 10. The DC-8 was turning toward the runway when something went wrong. They described that when they watched the airplane as it turned towards runway 10, the bank angle continuously increased. It's not going to make it. No way. US Navy pilots watching Flight 808's landing approach fear they're witnessing a disaster in the making. Come on, level off, man, level off. Normally, you don't want to be turning more than about 10, 20 degrees on final approach. They watched this airplane as it went from 30 degrees to 40 degrees to 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and they were really surprised. And then they saw the wings go about 90 degrees relative to the horizon. The nose pitched down, and the airplane struck the ground. Sounds like a wing stall. Yes, sir, it sure look like it. Yeah. 
What the pilot describes sounds like a condition known as aerodynamic stall, where the wings aren't producing the lift needed to keep the plane in the air. So you now have the dynamic. You understand how the aircraft struck the ground. Now you have to determine why. The investigators learned that neither pilot had ever landed a DC-8 at Guantanamo. They wonder if the captain knew that runway 10 was a more challenging approach than runway 28. They studied the airline's procedures. They had to watch a video. That's it. Because of the difficulty landing at Guantanamo, military pilots require special training to land on runway 10. But the cargo airline only required its civilian pilots to watch a short video. Exercise extreme caution when landing on runway 10. Records show the captain and first officer had both watched the training video within the past year. Align your base leg just to the right of the strobe beacon. This beacon identifies the U.S.-Cuban boundary beginning at the shoreline. To avoid Cuban airspace on the left, the plane must make a tight right turn. Where's the strobe? Right over there. It where? Right over there. It where? The captain can't locate the strobe light that marks the Cuban border. You know, we're not getting our airspeed back there. The flight engineer notices that the plane is still flying more than 10 knots too slow. Where's the strobe? Right down there. I, I still don't see it. Instead of increasing his airspeed, the captain keeps trying to find the strobe light. Flight engineer Richmond sees the DC-8 isn't properly positioned for the landing. Do you think you're going to make this? Yeah. If I can catch the strobe light. First Officer Curran is also concerned. But Captain Chapo isn't taking the hint. The DC-8 begins its critical final turn. The team needs to know why the crew didn't abandon an approach that was clearly going wrong. August 7, 1997. Fine Air Cargo Flight 101 prepares to take off from Miami to the Dominican Republic. At 12.30 p.m., when Flight 101 taxis to its runway, First Officer Petrosky recites a familiar drill. Okay, standard fine air procedure. If there's a problem prior to V1, which is 130 knots, the pilot in command will board the airplane. Treat anything after V1 as an in-flight emergency. Sounds good. At 12.34, the tower makes contact. Fine Air 101, fly heading 270, cleared for takeoff. Clear takeoff 27 right. Fine Air 101 heavy. OK, four spooled and stable. Max power. OK, coming up on 60 knots, power set. 80. V1. Rotate. The plane lifts off the runway. Okay, easy, easy. Easy, easy, easy. You're up. alarmed by what he now sees. What's going on? Whoa! Whoa! The crew fights to get the plane under control. Too low. Gear. Too low. Too low. Terrain.
It's the unthinkable, a plane crash in the heart of Miami. The plane's three-man crew and security guard are confirmed dead. Less than a mile from Miami International Airport is the scene of a terrifying airplane disaster. NTSB investigators start collecting eyewitness accounts. A couple of the witnesses mentioned seeing flames coming from the number four engine on the right side. The investigators wonder if the plane suffered a major engine failure, which prevented it from getting airborne. Bob Benson searches for a telltale clue that the engines were working. Turbine blades bent sideways suggest they were still spinning rapidly when the plane hit the ground. We looked inside them, and it looked like they were all operating at high power settings, just from visual examination. They were definitely spinning. The investigators rule out engine failure, but quickly get new information from the plane's air traffic controller. Just after takeoff, he, he went steeply nose up. I could see the tops of the wings. The discovery explains the flames witnesses saw. If a plane is pitched too steeply, airflow to the engine is interrupted, causing too much fuel to flow through the engines. It's simply an airflow issue. There wasn't enough air getting into the engines. And you get a lot of extra fuel that's on fire, and it's going out the back of the engine. NTSB investigator Evan Byrne now wonders why the plane's nose rose up so suddenly. What this told us early in the investigation was that we either had a problem with the airplane, something that the pilots did during the takeoff, or there may have been something wrong with the load. The NTSB has hit an impasse in its investigation into the fine air crash. The mystery of Flight 101 has only deepened. But then, the investigation gets a break. Benson. An informant calls with a guilty conscience. Who is this? OK, I'm listening. He won't disclose his identity. But the caller reveals there's extra weight on the plane that the investigators are overlooking. Their figures don't include the pallet or the netting. The investigators now calculate the weight of the cargo, including pallets and netting. It's more than 5,000 pounds of extra weight. Now we're getting somewhere. The added weight could have had an effect on the plane's balance. The NTSB investigators think Fine Air Flight 101 crashed because it was overweight. So they want to test their theory in a flight simulator. OK, we're good to go. 5,000 extra pounds have been added to reflect the true weight and balance of the aircraft. Benson's amazement, the plane lifts off without a problem. It rises in a stable climb. Damn. The pilots themselves were able to, to fly out of, out, out of the situation. Uh, and uh, we scratched our heads a bit. What am I missing? Benson's team needs to dig deeper if they hope to understand why the flight went so horribly wrong. Tarum Flight 371 has slammed into a farmer's field, just a few hundred yards from a local train station outside Bucharest. Romanian investigators are still searching for the cause of the crash. 
I felt the pressure from the media and internally within Taro after I was appointed as an investigator. Bodizantu needs to figure out if the airplane was mechanically sound. Was the A310 properly maintained? Had it been in for servicing recently? The passenger jet's logbook provides a detailed record of its flight and service history. It can tell investigators exactly what servicing and repairs the plane has undergone. Looking good so far. Bodhisattu finds that all scheduled maintenance was performed on time. So nothing unusual? Only this. A couple of times in the previous year, the auto throttle hadn't moved properly during flight. The auto throttle commands the throttles to move whenever a change in power is required. On takeoff, the throttles are at maximum. Once the plane reaches the climb phase, less power is needed. The throttle should move slightly back automatically. Tarum pilots had complained that in climb mode, the throttle for the left engine sometimes moved too far back, all the way to idle. This placed the two engines at different power settings. Bodhisattu discovers the auto throttle issue has been plaguing this plane for a very long time. In the last year alone, there's almost two dozen complaints about the auto throttle problem. This one's from the captain. Lead investigator Stoichescu discovers that Captain Baranayu himself had reported this very problem months ago. The captain recorded it in the plane's logbook. He did what the briefing card instructed and held the faulty thrust lever from moving back. Everything worked out fine. If you knew about this problem and you knew what to do, how could it have caused the accident? Searching to understand why Tarum Flight 371 slammed into the ground shortly after takeoff. V1, rotate. The investigators turn their attention to the pilots. They wonder if there's anything in their flight records to suggest they made a fatal mistake. Okay, let's go. The captain first. Captain Baranoyu spent his entire career at Taro. Graduated military flight school in 1969. He'd flown more than 14,000 flight hours on six different aircraft. Lots of flight hours. I flew with Captain Batanoyu. He was a prepared pilot, conscientious, attentive to what he was doing. Next. Pilot Stoy graduated military flight school in 1968. The first officer was also experienced. His training record is excellent. They were a good match. Yeah. So, two excellent pilots in the cockpit that day. Next, they check the medical records. Captain Batanayu, high mental condition, fit for long range flights. Captain looks good. The captain was 48 years old. The first officer, 51. But despite increasing age, their medical reports are both flawless. First officer Stoy, close to retiring age. Good level of information processing, motivated for flight. Stable personality. Assessments of their physical and mental status lead to one conclusion. Both were medically and psychologically fit to fly. 
Both plane and pilots have passed close inspection. What could have caused such a dramatic loss of control? Continental Airlines Flight 1404 is being prepped for its departure from Denver, Colorado. Captain David Butler and First Officer Chad LeVang will pilot the flight to Houston. The plane is a Boeing 737, a short to medium range twin engine jet that has become the best selling commercial jetliner in history. Continental 1404, Denver Tower. Runway 34 right, position and hold. Position and hold 34 right, Continental 1404. Runway 34 right is one of six runways at Denver International. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. Turn right, heading 020. Runway 34 right is cleared for takeoff. The controller provides the pilots with a runway wind reading of 27 knots and clears them for takeoff. Heading 020, clear for takeoff, runway 34 right, content of 1404. Suddenly, the plane veers hard to the left. races off the runway at a speed of more than 100 miles an hour. It's completely out of control. The plane hits a steep ridge, sending it airborne. finally comes to a stop 700 feet from the runway. All 110 passengers and five flight crew narrowly escape death. The captain is seriously injured. The first officer's injuries are minor. The question now is how could this have happened in the first place? Thank you. With the cause of Flight 1404's crash evading investigators, the NTSB must now consider factors outside the plane that could have contributed to the Boeing 737's fate. We're missing anything? No. No, we got all I need. NTSB senior meteorologist Don Ike will investigate the weather conditions at the time of the crash. Reports from the National Weather Service indicate there was a low pressure system in parts of Colorado around the time of the crash. But it had no impact on Denver International. There was no severe weather at the time. Runway 34's surface was bare and dry. Well, whatever it was, it happened real fast. The investigators now turn their attention to the crosswinds during takeoff. It looks like weather vaning to me. Weather vaning occurs when a crosswind pushes a plane's tail, causing the nose to point into the wind. A pilot must apply rudder to counteract this movement. A 737-500 can handle crosswinds up to 33 knots, but if the gusts are stronger, it might have been enough to blow the plane off the runway. Bill English needs to confirm that the pilots weren't attempting to take off in crosswinds that exceeded the safety limits for the 737. All right, queue up ATIS. Main departure, runway three. Prior to takeoff, the pilots would have received the current weather conditions from the Automatic Terminal Information Service, or ATIS. ATIS reported winds of 280 degrees at 11 knots, well under the 33-knot threshold. 
But pilots don't just rely on ATIS. Air traffic control also provides specific runway winds right before takeoff. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The investigators speak with a controller on duty that night. Thanks for taking the time for us. Of course. OK, so what were the conditions at takeoff? Well, I uh, checked the winds just before. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The controller told the crew to expect 27 knot winds on runway 34, a speed still below the crosswind limit of 33 knots. Anything else that could help explain what happened? No. I'm as stumped as you guys. Russian authorities work around the clock to clear the wreckage of Aeroflot Nord Flight 821 from the crash site on the Trans-Siberian Railway. They need to get the trains running again. Be careful with us. Bring it over here. Meanwhile, Russian investigators from the Interstate Aviation Committee, the IAC, will work to find the cause of the accident. Photos of Flight 821's crash site offer up clues about the orientation and pitch of the plane when it hit the ground. The flying control surfaces, the fuselage, the engines, totally destroyed. And it flew past the approach line. We need to find out why. The Russian investigators want to understand the reasons that led to such a catastrophic loss of control just minutes before landing. It was raining. Let's track down the weather chart. Thank you for making trip from Washington. I hope we can help. American investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board join the team. What about the uh, flight recorders? On the plane to France, they're in rough shape. The cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were badly damaged in the fire. They were sent to a specialized facility in France to retrieve the data. But it could take weeks to get the results. In the meantime, the Russian investigators briefed the Americans on their progress. We found no evidence of the mechanical failure in the engines. What about an in-flight fire or breakup? The plane first hit these trees on the left embankment, and all the debris was confined in the immediate area. There's no scorching on the trees, no breakup prior to crash. The fire started on the ground. The investigators are certain Flight 821 was intact before it crashed. The first step in investigating the Aeroflot Nord 821 crash is finding out if the 737 was mechanically sound when it left Moscow. In Russia, tracking down records can be complicated by bureaucratic roadblocks. Great, we got them. Let's see what they can tell us. Good. They go back to when the plane went into service. A safety and certification company, Bureau Veritas, regularly inspected the Boeing 737 and kept detailed records going back years. When this aircraft went down, the rudder system became an object of interest. Remember the design flaw in the 737's rudder that we discovered in the 1990s? It caused multiple accidents before it was caught. In 1994, U.S. Air Flight 427 was approaching Pittsburgh when a problem known as rudder hardover caused the aircraft to nosedive and slam into woods nearby. All 132 people on board that 737 were killed. 
it was not an isolated incident. The rudder hard over was something that occurred because of a mismatch between hydraulic pressure on the rudder on the 737, which caused the rudder to move in one direction, which could not be reversed with the rudder pedals. Boeing decided to redesign the actuator of the rudder system to prevent these rudder hard overs. Have a look. Did they fix this one? But you never can be perfectly sure that the fix is in. The team now considers whether a frozen rudder caused Flight 821 to nosedive into the ground. They hunt for the maintenance records for any mention of the rudder. Wait, I've got a work order here. It's from 2005 for replacing the rudder PCU. It's a match. They took a look at the power control unit for the rudder and found that the airplane had the new system fitted, and then the investigation moved on from there. The airline insists both pilots was very experienced. Still looking for leads in the case of Aeroflot Nord Flight 821, the team shifts the focus to the pilots. And yet the controller said the crew seemed confused when he asked them to redo their approach. Captain had over 3,900 flying hours, 1,400 of this at night. That's not a ton, but it's enough. Wait, two-thirds of his hours were in the cockpit of the Tupoli 134. The 2134. Built in Russia, the Tupolev 134 was one of the most widely used jets in the former Soviet bloc. It required twice as many crew members to fly them as a modern Western jet like Boeing or Airbus. The placement of the engines on the Tupolev is also different. The engines are close together at the rear of the plane. In this design, mismatched engines require minimal adjustment since the thrust is all coming from the back. A Boeing 737's engines are spaced apart, slung beneath the wings. With a mismatch in engine power, the stronger side pushes the wing up and requires the pilot's constant correction of control surfaces to maintain balance. The team delves into the training records for the captain of Flight 821. They need to know if he was properly trained to fly a 737, especially one with mismatched engines. And the vet have got his training certification for the 737 on September 10th, 2006, but then went back to flying the Tupolev. He didn't get into the 737 again until January 9th, 2007. The investigators now know that Captain Medvedev's training on the Boeing 737 was woefully inadequate. The team realizes that First Officer Alaberton had much more flying experience than the captain. OK, tomorrow we'll try the air. Take care. What they now need to find out is if the First Officer was any better equipped to fly the 737. I am from IAC. I have a quick question for you. The investigators wonder how the first officer performed during his 737 training. He had plenty of experience on Antonov 2. An Antonov 2 is a huge propeller biplane with a single engine designed mainly for agricultural and forestry purposes. The investigators learn that one thing the first officer struggled with was flying with thrust asymmetry. Check the speed you are banking. Bank angle. Bank angle. You're banking. Bank angle. Bank angle. This is the third time. Bank angle. The investigators are surprised by the extent of the first officer's shortcomings flying the 737. Medvedev was simply too green to captain the 737. The team concluded that the airline should never have paired a new captain with such an unproven first officer. 
Chapecoense goalkeeper Jackson Fullman has survived the crash of La Mia Flight 2933. I woke up in the middle of the forest. I don't know how long I'd been asleep for. Besides Jackson Fullman, three other Chapecoense players have survived. 71 people are dead, making this one of the worst tragedies in the history of sport. The morning light reveals the full extent of the crash. The La Mia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain called Cerro Gordo. The Colombian Aircraft Accident Investigation Group wastes no time starting their work. The team is on site at daybreak, with Julian Echeverri in charge. It looks like the fuselage spun around 180 degrees. Echeverri and his team work around the clock, collecting evidence in the mountain. Landing gear was down. Look, the flaps are extended. The plane was configured for landing. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. But it crashed. 10 miles short of the runway. The investigators have a tough job ahead. Aircraft debris has tumbled down both sides of the mountain. But their biggest clue is what they don't find at the scene of the crash. No scorch marks. No fuel smell either. The fuel level indicators are at zero. The plane was out of fuel. The investigators are mystified. Why would the plane have run out of fuel? Was it a fuel leak? Engines one and four are up there. Two and three are here by the main wreckage. All four engines are located and examined. There is no sign of fire or failure. They conclude the engines worked until the fuel ran out. The question is, how did the fuel get so low in the first place? Was it a mechanical failure or human error? With pressure mounting, the investigators dig into their work. They hope the flight recorders will help them understand why La Mia 2933 didn't make it to the airport. Take these black boxes to the lab. Both the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder appear to be in good shape. But they'll have to be sent to a lab to be processed before investigators can analyze them. While the flight recorders are being analyzed, investigators summon the last person to speak with the crew of La Mia 2933, air traffic controller. Thank you for meeting with me. It's been a very difficult time. Tell me what happened before they declared the emergency. Were there other planes on hold? Yes, three. Um, see, they were in a holding pattern right when La Mia radioed. What did you do when they told you they had a fuel emergency? But that's the crazy thing. They only told me that they had a fuel emergency right before they crashed, with no warning. The crew's delay in informing her put Molina in a tough situation. They were in a holding pattern. The investigators need to know how she handled it. To find out, they turned to the air traffic control tapes, which recorded the final 18 minutes of communication between Molina and the crew. OK, let's start. Red Eagle 2933, good evening. Lamia 2933 control, good evening. Lamia 2933, request priority for approach. We have a fuel problem. Even after reporting a fuel problem, the crew doesn't give Molina any cause for concern. Understand you are requesting priority for landing also with a fuel problem, correct? Affirmative. How long until you need to start your approach, 293? Only when Molina checks in with them does the crew finally speak up. We have a fuel emergency. That's why I'm asking you at once for final approach, requesting immediate descent. Pause. They declare a fuel emergency. 
seven minutes after entering the holding pattern. Why wait so long? Then they turn left here towards the runway. Turning left puts flight 2933 in the direct path of other planes in the holding pattern. Keep going. Lamia 2933, make a right turn now to begin your descent. Negative. We're already starting to descent. I'm heading for the runway. Moments later, the crew reports the plane has lost power. 2933, total electrical failure without fuel. Stop. They didn't explain the situation until it was too late. There's nothing she could have done. The investigators conclude Milena did what she could to help Lamia 2933 in those stressful moments before the crash. But the recordings raise another question. Here's what I don't get. The fuel warning should have gone off long before the start of the approach. But they don't declare an emergency until here. Did the plane's fuel warning system malfunction? Or is there another reason for the crash that they'll need to explore? United Express Flight 6291. This is the first fatal accident involving the Jetstream 4100. For the safety of all the passengers using this plane, it's critical to figure out what happened. By morning, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board, including lead investigator Al Dickinson, are on the scene. OK, let's make sure we got all four corners. They first need to find out if the entire plane is at the crash site. If any major parts are missing, it could mean the aircraft was breaking apart before it hit the ground. The importance of finding all four corners of the aircraft is if something comes off an aircraft before impact, you probably can trace it back to the initial cause of why they had a problem. So it's really important to identify both wingtips, the nose, and the tail. But their challenge is immense. What's left of United Express 6291 is barely recognizable as an airplane. The fire was very intense, and it made it hard just to try to identify the different pieces of the aircraft. You see stuff, and you wonder, what is it? We've got the nose over here. We've got the tail over here. We found all four corners of the aircraft right at the accident site. And we've got the wings out over there. So the aircraft was intact until it contacted the ground. And therefore, you can eliminate any structural thing that might have happened during flight. The plane did not start coming apart in midair. But was the pilot in control? We have a cold front running through here. What were the weather advisories telling pilots? Dickinson hopes the experience of other pilots that night can shed light on what happened to United Express 6291. Rhyme mixed icing between 2,000 and 19,000 feet. Did any other flights fly through it? If other pilots flew through the same icing conditions, they might have experienced a similar problem. Yes, two just before 6291 was due in. OK, let's talk to them. In this case, there were planes flying in the general area, and some of them landed at the airport in Columbus. So it's important to talk to these pilots to find out what the conditions were on their descent. And it was rhyme ice? The pilot of a plane that landed one minute before Flight 6291 was due in remembers descending through freezing drizzle. What do you think you picked up? About a half inch? And it didn't give you any trouble? OK, thanks. Hey, same amount of ice, but no trouble. The pilots of other planes reported similar conditions, but had no problems landing. The fact that several airplanes landed preceding this airplane under similar weather conditions means the weather should not have precluded a safe landing at the airport. Thanks for coming in. 
So you left at 7? And when the investigators speak to United Express pilots who earlier in the day flew the same plane through similar weather. And you had to de-ice. They reported no difficulties with the plane's de-icing system. We looked at everything that was involved in the weather situation. They should have been able to fly through this moderate icing and land successfully. 